Well, we can go ahead and get started officially. Um, so thank you for, for coming virtually uh, to the session on introducing Scopus. Um, we are going to be looking at a few slides at first and then really jumping more into a live demo. And so um, I'll send these slides out afterwards kind of for your reference. Um, my name, uh, just for those who don't know me, is Erica Pai. I'm the scholarly communications librarian here. And um, James Weiser, the Dean of the library is also here and is also uh, familiar with Scopus and um, we'll, we'll give some feedback, I think maybe at the end and he's, he can answer questions. Um, I do not know, disclaimer, I do not know everything there is to know about Scopus. I, I, I'm not sure who does, there's a lot there. <laughs> um, but I have been encouraged by um, the ease of use as I've, as I've used it more. Um, there's some really good training videos out there um, so after this session, if you want to look around online for those, um, they're, they've been very helpful to me. So we'll just kind of scratch the surface on, on, on Scopus and how to use it. And if you have questions at the end, hopefully we can, we can get to those. So, and if you have questions or want to jump in, just say something, or if you can't hear me, uh, just let me know and I'll pause, but we'll, we'll get started. So. So Scopus is the largest abstract and citation database of peer reviewed literature, features smart tools that allow you to track, analyze and visualize scholarly research. So some of you may be more familiar with Web of Science. This is kind of a competitor to that, um, kind of gotten more popular in the last 10 years. I believe it was started in 2004. Um, and so that from this infographic, you can just see that it's got a lot of stuff in it, right? 78 million items, 16 million author profiles, um, around 70,000 affiliation profiles. And there on the right, it just kind of, you know, a summary of different things you can do on Scopus, um, which I'll kind of get to. I won't read all those. You can have these slides and look at them later, um, but just for a point of reference. So, Again, I'm going to go through the slides and then we'll jump in um, to the actual live demo. But when you are wanting to access Scopus, I would recommend going through through the AC Library's website. So we've got um, this is kind of a screenshot of the home page and there's a research databases um, list, research databases list there that you'll click on. And I'll, I'll show you how to do that. My hope is that you've been to the library's website, but if you haven't, you'll get to see that as well. So let's see. Um, we'll start with looking at just doing a basic keyword search. If again, if you if you're familiar with the library's website and have done searches on um, on OneSearch or in our catalog, there's there's some similarities there. Um, so this is just a screenshot of kind of what that looks like. Um, there's different characters you can use depending on, on the type of search you want to do. So curly brackets for an exact phrase, uh, quotations for an approximate phrase, and then the asterisk for truncation. And again, when we get to the live demo, I'll show you more about that. And then you've got your results again, similar to, to OneSearch. There's a lot of ways you can filter and limit um, it's very easy to go back and edit your search. Um, you can make the search string, it, it, it lists it all right there for you. Um, and you can go and edit it, add to it. You can save your searches if it's a search that you think you'll be doing a lot, you can set alerts for it. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention is that um, when, you, when you log on, you probably won't have an account. Let me go back real quick here. Um, Let's see. Oh yeah. So there, my my name is highlighted. That EP Erica Pie. That's I because I have created an account. I think through possibly Elsevier, who owns Scopus. Um, that's there, and there are certain things like um, saving and setting alerts that really you need to be logged in to do those things. But most of the stuff you don't have to actually create that account to do. So it's fine if you don't want to do that or if you don't see your name there. Um, but I did just want to point that out. And then this is obviously, you know, a citation and abstract database. 
But what, one cool thing is that you can click on locate full text. Uh, I've circled down here and see if, if ACU, if we have access to the full text version of anything. So if it's something you're very interested in, that's uh, available. We'll look at analyzing results. So if there's a particular topic you're wanting to search, um, you could find out things such as like, when did research begin on this topic? When did it increase? Which journals publish the most on this particular topic? Which researchers are the most active? Top countries linked to this research? There's, there's so much here. So um, we'll go over how to get to that, what that looks like. For specific articles, they have article metrics, like the number of citations in Scopus, um, citation benchmarking, field weighted citation impact, which is kind of has this, this formula of how they figure that out. But the, the easiest way for me to understand it is if it's greater than one, that means it's cited more than expected for article similar articles. So obviously this, uh, this screenshot here is an article that's cited in the 99th percentile. So it's field weighted citation impact is, is 10, much, much greater than one. Um, this, beyond searching for, for documents, um, we'll, we'll look at author profiles. Um, some of you may have an author profile in Scopus. <clears throat> so Scopus automatically creates those um, once when it gets a document and it has authors on it. What I have found is that it won't create a profile if you if an author just has one document, it will list the author, but it won't be clickable. So I think what I've learned is that an author has to have two or more documents, and then you can click on the profile, and it'll look something like this. Um, it'll show your affiliation. Um, so if yours does not say Abilene Christian University, that would be a good thing to just go ahead and change or edit on your profile, and then you know, you'll be able to see things like how many documents the author has, how many citations, the H index. Again, we'll go over that in more detail. And then lastly, we'll look at doing an affiliation search. So this is just a screenshot of searching Abilene Christian University. And this is kind of a, a pie chart of the subjects that that research is being published in. So you can see that, you know, physics and astronomy is a big chunk of that. Um, and then we've got all these other pieces. So um, this is, I found this very interesting, you know, just being at ACU, seeing what research is being done, what journals ACU authors are publishing in. Um, and there's over 500 ACU author profiles. So um, if you're not one of those people and you think you should be, you can, you can edit your Scopus account and, and you'll be one of those people. So, okay, so I'm gonna exit this and um, start doing more of a live demo. So does that look okay? Okay, so I'm just here at the library's website again. Um, so I'm coming here to research database lists. It's in alphabetical order. Again, maybe many of you might be saying this looks really familiar and that's awesome. Um, so here's Scopus. Okay, so this is what it looks like. I actually, it did log me in um, automatically. You can see that it says it's, you know, I'm getting access through Abilene Christian University. If it doesn't say that, um, you may not quite be in there. Um, just let us know if you have problems with accessing the database. So we'll start on documents. You want to make sure that's highlighted to do a, a this is basic keyword search. So the default here is article title, abstract, and keywords. You can see there's a, a ton of other things that, that you could pick. Um, so we'll just do a sample search. And just because COVID is on everyone's minds. So I'm using that asterisk, um, COVID and psych, using the asterisk search with anything, a wild card at the end, psychology, psychologist, psychoanalyze, just anything there. And then maybe I want to do kind of a phrase together, college students. I will say it says on their site to use these curly brackets for an exact phrase. When I've been using them, I've 
it's kind of been giving me an error message on the, on the basic search. So just be aware that at least for me, it's kind of been doing weird stuff. But but hypothetically, if you wanted something like, you know, with a hyphen and you wanted that hyphen in your search, you could use those those brackets. Um, you can add another search field. There's these operators here. And if you want to include all these, I'm going to do or here just to broaden it a little bit. Maybe we want to say pandemic instead of COVID. Again, you would search whatever is of interest to you. So we'll just do a search. And so this is kind of what, again, a preliminary search would look like. We've got limiters here. You can limit to open access um, or exclude. I like that option too. You can limit by, maybe you just want the most recent years. There's authors. Okay, and I, it'll tell you if the article is open access right there. There's the locate full texts and it's sorting them um, right here by date newest. You can pick to sort by the highest cited Okay, and at least in this example, that would be this one here with 626 citations. And let's can I jump in and ask a question real quick? I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. what are those colors uh, under open access, like gold, hybrid gold? Yeah, there are different, different levels of access. I bet, I bet um, well, that's not what I wanted. But all open, I don't remember the definitions. James may be able to jump in here, but there's different kind of levels here. James, do you want to say something about those? Sure. So can you guys hear me okay if I unmuted? Um, so uh, there are largely four different kinds of open access. Gold open access is where the author or the researchers have paid what's called an article processing charge to unlock that article on the journal publisher's website for it to be freely available to all. That's pretty common in science research, the natural sciences that's grant funded. Um, hybrid gold means it's actually in a subscription journal in which that article is one part that's unlocked. Gold, there, there are a series of purely gold open access journals like the Public Library of Science or PLOS, PLOS One, for example, some of you may have heard. Hybrid gold is where you've published in a journal like Nature, but you've paid to unlock it for the world. Bronze is, I'm not surprised to see bronze here at such a high number. It's usually pretty uncommon, but what a bronze open access article is, is when the publisher has temporarily made something freely available to all, but only on a temporary basis. So a lot of STM and, and other journal publishers have made COVID research free during the pandemic. That doesn't mean it will always be open access, but for now it is. And then green open access is a link to the institutional repository for that particular author. Um, so, you know, we have an open access policy here at ACU where uh, a, a preprint of that article or even the article of record can be ingested and mounted to our institutional repository after a particular um, embargo period has passed. Um, so that's what green is. We're, we're actually gonna do a talk about this in, in April, Eric and I are on open access and open access at ACU. Um, there's so much more that could be said. Uh, I, I fear I have only made things more confusing, but th that's what those are. Thank you. That, that that was all completely new information to me. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank you, James. All right. So you can see here I'm, lo I'm logged in EP up at the top right. And so doing things um, here like saving a search, if I, again, if I really wanted to do that, I could save it and I could title it something and it'll be here under my saved searches. Let me just show you that real quick. Um, these are just random examples, but you can see how many documents it currently had the last time it was run. You can refresh that. If you want to set an alert, this, this little bell is that. So maybe I want to get an alert about that every week. I want to be updated make sure I'm keeping up with it. Um, that's something that you could do. 
So, and again, that's that's something that you kind of need to be logged in to get those saved. So if I want to edit this, just hit edit. And this is actually um, a good segue because now it's taken me actually to the advanced search format. Um, I think either way is fine. It, how you want to search. If, if basic search is better for you, that's great. If advanced does more for you, um, for your needs, then that's great. So, so you could get rid of just part of this and hit search again, um, depending on how you want to edit it. I'm going to just start a totally new search um, on here. So let's just Say we wanted to search postpartum depression. And with this one, it kind of wants you to click on things. It's got the Boolean operators here and, and or the preclude proceeds by and within. I don't use those as often, so I forget what they what they are. But it's nice. It, it explains what they are, how to use them. You've got field codes here, um, which I'll, I'll add one of those. Um, let's say I wanted to add psychology, you know, I'm really interested in looking at that. So I could go down here near the bottom. And if I need to know more about that, I can click on it. It'll give me some information and then I can hit this plus sign. Um, and you can see that it's that it's added it there. And Erica, yeah, as as you're typing the ands and ors, I notice you're putting them in all capital letters. Is that um, is that necessary? Well, it looks like it, here it's still bringing it up. I like to just, that's how I do it, just to make sure it's its getting it right. I don't know that you have to do that. Okay. Um, but I mean, that's just since that's the format they have. And then when it pops up on the advanced, I always just like to click it. Um, that may be overkill. <laughs> it may be making more work for myself than I, than I need to. So, um, just in case I like to try to, and it helps me when I look back at it, like if I'm gonna edit this search that it's, okay, this is a phrase here and, you know, and I don't know, it highlights it for me that that's not something I'm searching, I guess, but your preference may be different, so. Okay, so obviously we got a ton of, of documents for that, which is fine. Um, so we talked about setting alerts. Um, let's actually, let me go back really quick. I wanna show you all one more thing. I think at the bottom here, didn't do it that time. Um, I think on the key basic keyword search, if you go to the bottom, sometimes it'll just have your most recent searches, even if you haven't saved them. Um, so just know that if there was a search you did a couple times ago, you could say, oh, I, I need to get back to that or somehow I got off that page and um, you could scroll down and, um, and hopefully get it there. So, okay, so I think we're gonna move on here to maybe analyzing search results. Again, I know there's a lot you can do. There's a lot of things that um, we would just, aren't gonna be able to get into all of it. Again, if you have questions, feel free to, to jump in, but I'm gonna click on this analyze search results here. Okay, and so it's got our search string up here. Um, it's, and it'll start with kind of documents by year. And since this isn't a very big range, let me just show you, um, let me edit it and make it a little bit broader of a search because I just want to show you something. I'm going to get rid of the year limiters. Let's try that. Going back to analyze. Okay, yeah, this is more what I wanted um, to show you. Um, I think it did a different search, but that's that's fine. Um, so you'll just see that like, this is going back to COVID because it redid my search, but um, you'll see that there's not much here and then there's a spike and then it goes down in 2021. That's because 
2021 is not completed yet. So if you wanted, you could say, well, I really am only interested, um, you know, in, in these last couple years, because that's really where research is. So you can edit that. Um, you can look at, you know, I, I just want to see all the documents from 2020 and there's 98. So I can click on that. It'll show me what they are. Um, if I'm really interested in those, I can save to a list or I can create a bibliography of those. Um, let me go back there. So that kind of kind of going back, it, it sometimes doesn't save what you've picked, but maybe I'm interested in, you know, what sources are being published. Um, or if you, if, you know, if you know a topic that you personally are planning to publish in, this might be a good thing to use um, because it'll show you, okay, here, here are the journals or sources that this topic is being published in. And I, this compare, compare sources chart is kind of neat. You can pick up to 10 different ones. Um, you can take away just however you want to look at it. So when you think about which journals publish the most on this topic or which journals might I submit my research to, um, that, could be, that could be helpful. You can see um, you know, which, which institutions are publishing on a topic. And again, feel free to change the years here um, to just kind of look at that. You can look at documents by type. Um, you can see a lot is going to be articles there, documents by subject area, a lot in medicine, psychology. Okay, so there's a lot there that you could drill into, um, which is really cool. So we'll go back to looking at an article here. That was kind of, let's see, let's try to get back to. Search. Okay. Has Scopus always been this detailed, or this has this happened in the last two to three years that all of these features are available? I'm not sure about that. I know someone slightly off of your question, but someone had asked if it was mostly heavy on sciences and did it have humanities? And I, I know when I was looking into it, I know they have tried to up up their game in like arts and humanities. And so I'm not sure as far as features, how many of these are like new or not. Um, James, it, anything to add there? No, you're, you're right. When they started, they were heavily in the natural sciences. Then they kind of branched out more to social sciences and they're doing more and more with arts and humanities. They're still, if I can be honest, a little weak in arts and humanities. And, and some of that is simply because the nature of the scholarly, you know, human, humanists still publish books more than journal articles in general, whereas in the hard science, the natural sciences and social sciences definitely moving more and more towards a journal. Journals are much more easily indexed and can track citations than books, though I've been impressed by the number of books that Scopus has added I would say that that is a, a caveat in, in poor, you know, whenever you're using this is that arts and humanities people may find Scopus less impactful than social scientists who will find it less impactful than, you know, than chemists and engineering people, um, if that answers your question. But they've, they've made a lot of investments. One of the reasons why we chose Scopus over Web of Science is because more and more universities are actually dropping Web of Science and moving towards Scopus, which has allowed them to make further investments in making it a better product, um, you know, for, for just an anecdote, I'm, uh, the, the University of Nebraska dropped Web of Science and went with Scopus about two years ago. Um, a lot of the schools in California where I you know, used to live and work ha have, have done the same. Are they including more ebooks than non-electronic books? I don't know the answer to that. I think, I think they're trying to, to include the most highly cited books and the format is probably not relevant um, because as an index, they're not trying to necessarily lead you to full text. They're mostly concerned with the citations within them. 
Sorry, Erica. Oh, you're good. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. So I'm keep questions are fine. Keep interrupting if you have more questions. Um, I'm going to. We did a search. I'm going by uh, just. I wanted to do it by sort it by the highest cited. So this brings us back to this one that's 626 citations because I just want to click on um, one a document so you can kind of see what that looks like. Um, we've got our article metrics over here on the right. Um, field weighted citation impact of 334, which is a lot more than one. So um, highly, highly cited. Just before we jump into seeing the metrics more in detail, um, so the, the source or the journal, you can click on right here. And this will kind of give you some information about that. There's a compare sources here. I'm not gonna click on it. It's kind of what we did in the analyze results page, but you could, put other journals or sources that you wanted to compare with this one up to 10, um, just to see how it compares. They have some information like site score, site score tracker, which I have not dived deep into enough to really understand what all those numbers mean, but, but there's, there's information there if, if you're interested in that. So let's say, let's just click view all metrics and it'll just kind of expand some of that. Um, I've noticed when we do that, it always starts with just a like a five year range here in the state. Now, since I think our topic is on COVID, it, you know, it may not be worth going back super far anyways, but, but you can do a few things here, exclude self citations or exclude citations from books. and look at the details of if you're interested in like when it says blogs here mentioned in two blogs. Um, hopefully my, my internet is stable. Uh, <laughs> uh, you could see which blogs it's talking about. So anyways, just wanted you to see that. So any qu more questions about searching or things like that? I'm, we're about to get into looking at author profiles. How do you, I think I was following along with you and I didn't see how you did it. How did you go back to the previous search where you could take out things in a search? Yeah, let's see. So let me just keep hitting the back here. So I can go to edit oh, right okay. here. Um, and then I can, I can edit that <laughs> frame there. Um, okay. Yeah, so good Thanks. question. Mm -hmm. For some reason, it looks like a, it has signed me out. So that maybe that's why, um, you, like I said, usually there's like a saved searches at the bottom, but again, it's not a huge deal because you can still do a lot of this stuff, but I'm gonna try to go back, back to the very basic uh, search. So now we were just doing all of that in the documents tab. So now um, let's just go quickly to authors and I, you know, just kind of found a random one. Um, if you knew the affiliation, that that might be good to put um, because as you'll see, we'll, you know, we get 51 results. Maybe Hannah Lee is. Um, so if, if you search yourself, <clears throat> going back to kind of editing your profile, you might notice that, hey, this is, let's say I'm Hannah Lee, this is mine. And you know what, actually these publications are mine as well. Um, you can request to merge those. So if you're seeing that for some reason, Scopus picked it up in two different places, or maybe it's from two different universities, um, you can kind of work on getting all your stuff under one profile um, and kind of pick the name. And so um, just be aware of that as you're, if you think about um, editing your profile, but we'll just, We'll pick this first one here. This is the one um, that I used in the in the slides in the screenshot. And so, again, just be sure to check your affiliation. If it's if it's not ACU, you know you can go ahead and change that. You can do things like connect to your Orchid um, or Mendeley account. 
it doesn't mean that whatever you put in Scopus is automatically going to ORCID or vice versa. It's just, I think, another way to identify you or help when people look you up, they can see that. So um, I could set alerts, you know, for this particular author or publisher um, if I wanted to do that. I won't do that now since I'm not really signed in anymore, but you can see how many documents she has, um, H index, like I said, most contributed topics. And then it, it starts listing all of the documents right here. So you could, you could click on one if you wanted. You could view the abstract. You could try to locate the full text. Um, you can sort them again by cited by highest to see what what uh, what's a popular article or, or publication that they've written. So, um, so kind of neat. Um, I don't personally have an actual Scopus profile um, to show you. Otherwise, I would. But um, but it's possible you may have one. So you should should look yourself up. Erica, do you know, uh, do you have to be, do you have to have an account and be logged in in order to be able to edit your pro profile? I don't know. Yeah, look, so you have to be able to sign in. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. And you might want to check this just to determine that, as Erica said, Scopus doesn't know necessarily when and if you've changed institutions. So if you published a paper, for example, while you were a grad student, you may have a profile with your, you know, with your grad school affiliation. And, and you, then if you publish a paper as ACU, you might have two different profiles, in which case you can collapse them and, you know, and, and streamline them in that way. Mm -hmm. If, for example, you've ever published anything about uh, professional wrestling and education, as I just found from you, Andrew. <laughs> well, I'll have to look that up later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks exciting. Sounds interesting. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, good question. Okay, so lastly, we did documents tab, authors tab. I'm just going to come here, just kind of again show you affiliations. You could search any of them, um, but we'll just do Abilene Christian because that makes sense. So you can see, um, you know, this is not every document or publication that ACU has ever done, but it's what's in Scopus right now. Um, so 1200, over 1200 documents. We've got uh, 569 authors listed, which is just kind of interesting to see. Um, they're sorted right now by the count, document count high to low. And so if you wanted, like I could click on these 435 documents and see everything that um, Mr. Basie has, has published here. Um, we can go to, you know, A to Z, however you want to do that. Um, so here's a good example. I'm not sure who Mr. Alden is, but he has one. So he has one document, but I actually can't click on his author profile. Whereas um, Zachary Al Albrecht, um, however you say his last name, uh, I can, he, he should have an actual profile. So that's just an interesting um, thing to notice there. And let's see, there's that that pie chart again that um, that was in the screenshot just of the subject areas, obviously, um, because, well, we have a lot of publications in physics and astronomy. And then we talked about how Scopus, you know, maybe leans a little more towards the sciences anyways. So there's 511 documents. Again, if you really wanted to, you could click on that. You could export that information or download it. You could create a bibliography if you wanted to, um, things like that. So let's see, documents by source. This is kind of neat too. So seeing where, where are these things being published, um, it's automatically doing it you know, by the highest. So you've got a lot of physics journals here up at the top, um, but you could, you could look at that. So that's kind of what that is. I think that was most everything I was planning to show. Um, like I said, there's there's plenty more here that you you could do and dive into in Scopus, but um, 
but we're hoping that gives kind of a broad overview. Um, what questions do you all have or of something maybe James or I could elaborate further on? Well, one of the things that that I would be interested in, in seeing if I could do is um, say we have a um, say I want to evaluate the library's holdings in a particular subject, or maybe we have a a a department accreditation coming up, and I would like to know if the library has what someone might consider the top ten journals in nursing. Would do, that. do you think Scopus might be a good tool to help me identify what are the mm -hmm. journals that are most published in in a particular field? And then I could check to see if we have them. Yeah, you can do that actually. If, like, for example, Erica, if you click up on the sources tab at the top, mm -hmm. you can, uh, you'll see. All of the you know 441,000 okay. journals that are indexed uh, in Scopus. If you want to, you're you're right. If you click on subject area, um, uh, it, scroll down, and there should be nursing at some point. Yeah, um, uh, <laughs> or I could type it in too. Or yeah, you could type it in too. Um, nursing. Yeah, oh. and click click the top one, and then uh, hit apply. And then you can see, for example, uh, world psychiatry, which is interesting. Um, but you can see the, the the listing based on site score. Some of you might wonder what site score is. Site score is is the Scopus version of impact factor. So if you've ever heard of a journal's impact factor, that is actually a trademark term by Thompson ISI, who produces Web of Science. Site score is the same thing. It's an attempt to quantify how often articles within a particular journal are cited, um, divided by number of articles published with the philosophy that the higher the number, the better. So in this particular case, you can see nursing plus open has a site score of 28.3, meaning on average, every article that lands in nursing plus open is cited 28.3 times somewhere else. Um, so, and you see the journals ranking too. So nursing plus open is one out of 116 in general nursing. So to answer your question, Laura, yeah, you could do it for this and then see, you know, obviously nursing plus open is open, open, open access. So everybody has that, but you know, as you scroll down, like maybe diabetes care, that would, that would be getting at what I think you're wanting to do in that case. Okay. Okay. But then like, like, um, like you both mentioned, Scopus is weighted a little more heavy in the sciences right now. So say, say I wanted to do it for music. Scopus has a category for music, but a citation index is only as good as the number of journals it's going to cover. Is there right. any way of knowing what, what portion of, you know, is it covering a large enough portion to trust the results to be a good representation? Yeah, that's a really great question. The answer is, uh, I don't know that you can know. Um, I, I personally, my opinion is in natural sciences and social sciences, I'd take this to the bank. Okay. In the arts and humanities, I would be very, very, um, I would be, I would be kind of suspicious. And when I say social sciences, business is included in that. I'm looking at Scott Stovall's, I'm just seeing Scott, if you're in here and you sure enough are. And, uh, your 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 articles about inherent conflicts of interest in the accounting profession uh, is 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 listed and and it looks like they do a really good job with accounting. Great, good question, Laura. But that is just a matter of uh, how many times it's been accessed. It doesn't actually tell you uh, the quality of the journal. Uh, like if tenure and promotion were to come forward and. And just because well, we're in 20 or 30 articles does it, it because it was accessible, not necessarily because it was the highest critical piece. 
Well, access isn't isn't measured. It's how many times an article is cited. So it's citations, not access. Um, you know, people could download an article, and it, it that's not being reflected in, in, in by Scopus. Um, you know, I think at ACU we're not as picky about you know impact factor or site score of the journals for for TNP, but in you know at R ones that's a, a a pretty big thing. Um, some R ones even look at impact factors of journals um, in in making those decisions. Um, but I think Tim, you're right. It's it's a guide. It's not it's not it's not, it's not scripture. <laughs> well, like Christianity, Christianity today might be more uh, accessed and, yes. and download that article may be downloaded more, but it's not journal of biblical literature. Right. Exactly. Cause it's, because it's not a scholarly journal. It's, it's, it's more of a trade journal. Yeah. Kind of related to that. Um, those, those questions from both Tim and Laura. Um, does Scopus, um, assess journal quality in some respect, like, for example, you know, keeping, you know, more of the predatory journals out of yes. the database. Okay. Yes, that is. And that, that is one of the things I was going to say is this could be helpful if you're looking to publish in a particular outlet or you're looking to cite something within those two areas. So social sciences and, and natural sciences, because of the comprehensiveness and, 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 you know, there are really only two big players in this market, Elsevier with Scopus and, and Thompson or ISI. Now, now it's Clarivate with Web of Science. If a particular journal is indexed, you can ascertain some measure of quality about it. They, they don't include predatory journals in, in their index. So that, that'd be a plus to use something like this yeah. over say Google Scholar or something. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, Google Scholar is, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna to rain on Google Scholar. Google Scholar is great in many, many cases. It just can't do all of the things that Scopus can do or Web of Science. Um, Thank uh, you. It's, it's more powerful. Yeah, I, I was thinking, I was writing down, you know, as a faculty member with new to Scopus, what are, you know, kind of three things that you might be able to use it for and, you know, finding, you know, vetting journals, if you're looking at where to submit things is one big thing you might be able to do. Um, as Erica pointed out, that highly cited or that the number of cited in articles might be helpful if you're doing research on a topic maybe you're not familiar. If it's in your wheelhouse, you know kind of the articles you've got to deal with if you're doing a lit review or you're doing some kind of review, but, but maybe you don't. And so if you're doing a search in a particular area, it might help you to, to sort on most impact, you know, most cited articles in that, that, that search. Cause that, that kind of would then stare at you and say, you know, maybe I need to deal with this. Maybe I need to at least, you know, cite it so that it, when I submit it for review, you know, reviewer two doesn't blast me for not referencing this particular work. Um, and, uh, and, and then that third issue that the third thing I was thinking you might be able to is that alerts, you know, you, you might want to set up an alert just so you don't miss something, you know, it might become spam. It might not depending on how well you craft your search, but you know, if, 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 you know, conflict of interest in accounting is something you really want to stay on top of setting up an alert and that might be something you would want to do just so you don't have to constantly be searching. Any other questions? Thank you, Erica. Uh, Sure. Yeah. Thank you all for being here and for the good questions. And thank you, James, for your expertise as well. So. Well, thank you for all your good work. We, I have recorded the session. So at some point, if you want a reminder of this topic, we'll have it linked, but um, otherwise I think Erica said she'll share the slides and uh, yes. if you have any other questions, feel free to ask Erica or, or, or me. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it.